I want to welcome you to spring 2017. I, it seems weird to say 2017. I remember when it, we were saying 1998. <laughs> but um, welcome, everyone. How is all of the Falcons feeling today? Are we good? Good. Good. So I'm, I'm hoping that everybody had a really wonderful holiday break and that at least for a little time, you were able to just sit back, kick back, and enjoy life and be refresh and recharge, be ready to get into those classrooms and interact and teach uh, as you always do and make the students' lives move forward as they're trying to work toward their goals. So to get, get started, we're going to introduce John Knight, our, our trustee. John uh, has been with the board since 2014. Congratulations on being reelected for another term. And we are very happy to have you as our representative. Interviewed me after I was reelected, and I told him what was so special about it because it was a, this was my third public office, but it was the first time I was ever reelected, so it was kind of special, <laughs> and special feeling for me. But anyway, thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> Kirkland. On behalf of the entire Los Rios Community College District Board of Trustees, it is my pleasure and honor to be with you here today at Folsom Lake College. As trustee speaking at convocation is one of the highlights of the, of the year for not only myself personally, but for all of the uh, trustees. With the start of the classes, uh, with the new semester approaching, I'm reminded of how important the work is that you do at this college. And this is where things happen at the trustee level, at the board level. You know, we try to support you in every way we can, and, and I hope we we're able to accomplish that. But it's in every one of the four colleges and centers we have, that's where the work is done. It is not hyper hyperbolic to say that we are literally changing the tra trajectory of the lives of thousands of students each year. And, and as we look at these students move through the system, you know, we're looking at gainful employment, specific employment needs for maybe some industry, and, and out allowing the students to move on in a, in a much more productive fashion. So you not only are affecting the lives of individual students, but the entire community and the region that we live in. It's an incredible opportunity and a responsibility that I know our dedicated faculty and staff do not take lightly. The chance to positively impact our students' lives is the reason I serve on the Board of Trustees, and know it is the reason you are here as well. So on behalf of not just my colleagues on the board, but the thousands of students uh, at, at, at all of our college and the countless others throughout the community, I'd like to thank you for your commitment and devotion to the students and the community and region that you're in. I hope that spring semester is, is rewarding for you as mentors and educators as it will be for the students we support in the community that we live in. And now it is my pleasure to introduce your Chancellor, Brian King, for his portion of, and he's sneaking up behind me. Thank you, John. Thank you. Kathleen, will you come out and join me for a second? It's great to be here with you today. There's a great family feel here today, and I want to do two things right away. First of all, this is your first official duty as interim president. Let's congratulate Kathleen on serving this interim role. And Folsom has a family feel, so we're going to come up here, here yes. for just a second. Kathleen and I made today Bring Your Dad to Work Day. So yeah. if both of our fathers will stand up for a second. This is my dad. Yeah. Turn around. Yeah. Wave at everybody. Thank you very much, both of you, for being here. Kathleen, we literally wouldn't be here without them. That's true. We wouldn't be. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. Clyde, finally, recognition. <laughs> thank you. So go ahead and have a seat. And I also want to acknowledge my daughter, Celia, who's here today. Thank you very much. She's been going to presentations like this since she was five years old, so. I heard stories about her. That's true. Did you know that we talk, I talk about you sometimes here? <laughs> Kathleen, thanks very much You're for having welcome. your father here. While we're all, uh, doing introductions, again, thanks to John, and congratulations on being reelected. Hopefully not for the last time, you said for the first time. Uh, 
This is our fourth convocation presentation today. We start the day at Cosumnes River College, then go to Sac City, then American River, and then here, and it's good to be closer to my home and with you today. I want to thank the members of our district office team who are part of this convoy throughout the region, starting with our Vice Chancellor of Finance and Administration, Teresa Matista. Our General Counsel, J.P. Sherry. Vice Chancellor of Instruction, Jamie Nye. And two new Associate Vice Chancellors I want you to be acquainted with. First, our Associate Vice Chancellor for Media and Community Relations, Gabe Ross. And our Associate Vice Chancellor for Resource Development, Paula Allison. You know this woman. Some of you may not have heard the bittersweet news, bitter for me, sweet for you and Bob, that uh, Sue is retiring in July. Oh, so this, this is her last round of convocation. That's not an awe so much, maybe. But let's all uh, congratulate Sue and thank her for 30 years of service. Now wait, Sue, I thought it would be nice, that this is your last convocation, for you to do the presentation. Oh, cool. As long as I don't have to sing like you did at Sac City, I can do that. Did you hear what she said? Yes. I'm not, if you were at Sac City, you would not want to repeat performance. Sometimes saying yes is not the right answer, but we had fun, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I have some talent, it's undiscovered, at least vocally. Hard to believe that six months has passed when, since we were together back in August talking about our new district strategic plan and our, our, our major goal of establishing effective pathways that optimize student success and access. So we've had very detailed conversation about what a pathway is and what it means and those conversations have continued today as I know you're working diligently on strategic planning here at Folsom Lake College. Three broad themes in our time together today. We'll talk more about pathways, where we are as a district and where you are as a college in building pathways. We'll talk about how promise programs are an exciting thing taking place in our region. You know about a promise program at Folsom Lake. And we have Mayor Terry here. While we're doing introductions, will you stand and take a bow, Mayor Terry? We'll talk later about the promise program with Rancho Cordova. And the big picture the fact that we can't do it alone, we can't do it just here at Folsom Lake College. We have to do the work in partnership with the other colleges in our district and in the state. And we also need the broader community if we really are going to redesign the experience our students have and change for the better the experience that our students have when they come to us. It's going to take all of our regional partners and we'll talk about a couple of new organizations that are helping build those regional opportunities for collaboration. And when we talk about the work we're doing, I know you know it, but it always helps me to have faces and names in mind of the students we're serving. This is uh, Caden Hackey, who is a student at West High in Sacramento. He's early in his high school career, and before long, he'll be thinking about college, and the work we're doing now will make that transition for him from high school to college more seamless. Same thing for these two young women who are early in their high school careers, Sarah Gogwe and Sahar Fomali, our two students in the region, who are also the reason that we're talking and looking at how we can do to make the processes better for our students and help them get to their goals more quickly. You know it's about the students, but it's helpful to think about very visually who the students are. On Wednesday, getting from the broader idea of helping students to the specifics of the new budget, we've talked a lot about pathways, and one of the headlines in the new budget was that Governor Brown has proposed $150 million statewide for Pathways programs. And our new chancellor, Eloy Oakley, from uh, formerly president of Long Beach City College, has been an advocate of the Pathways work. And this is his signature initiative in the first year as chancellor. So we'll work hard with Chancellor Oakley, with Governor Brown and the legislature to make sure that these funds are really helpful, not as a new initiative. How many of you are tired of new initiatives? A lot of new initiatives going on, so one of the things we'll be doing with the Pathways dollars 
is making sure that that supports the good work already underway. And our share of 150 million would be, Teresa, about 6.6 .6 million. So a very significant pool of one-time funds, I think worthy of applause, that amount of funding. So the good news is there is a proposed cost of living adjustment. The not so good news is that it's 1.48%. And we know that the costs involved with the work we're doing have increased by more than that rate. 1.48% translates into about 4.3 million for our colleges. So it's certainly better than back in 2008 when we were talking about how we were going to cut our budgets. But that's an area where we'll be working with the legislature. And additionally, on our operating base increase, 23.6 million sounds like a lot of money, but when it's, when it's spread across 113 colleges, can you see increase on the back row? That's not an accident that increase is small on the slide because it's about a million for our entire district. And obviously, our operating costs are increasing by more than a million. So one area of emphasis when we meet with the legislature in the coming weeks and months and the governor between now and the revision of the budget that the mayor does, in, that the governor does in May, will be to increase those operating dollars. So Governor Brown certainly has a reputation for being prudent financially. And many of you know the sad news that Sutter is no longer with us, right? Sutter the dog. And uh, when we looked at this slide, some of our staff were concerned that the governor is being attacked. This is a friendly <laughs> encounter with Sutter. And Sutter is actually acknowledged in the governor's budget that with a paw print, this is in the budget itself, saying, Save some biscuits for a rainy day. So that is an emphasis for the governor. Uh, we're hopeful that between now and May, some of the revenue estimates will be a little more generous. But we do, as a district, appreciate prudent financial planning. And Trustee Knight is here on behalf of our governing board. One reason that we have a great district is because our board is very focused on making thoughtful decisions financially. We had a board meeting this past Wednesday, and the board talked about actually increasing our operating reserves, knowing that the, the next recession, if it hasn't already started, will be upon us too soon. So let's acknowledge Trustee Knight on behalf of the elected board for that very thoughtful planning financially. The last thing in the budget, we've talked about quite a bit the last three years, money for access and growth. How many colleges in Northern California are growing in terms of enrollment? It's close to zero. Very few colleges, if any, in Northern California are experiencing enrollment growth. In Southern California, the growth is really focused on a two or three districts. So it's going to be a very interesting discussion as a system, how much emphasis we put on growth. And in August, we talked about the headline that we hoped would be old news by now, that our district is one of those Northern California districts faced with flat or declining enrollment. And uh, we want to be very transparent that from last spring to this spring, as we go into the new semester, we're down again semester to semester. We're hopeful that gap will close some, but realistically, we are not likely to be experiencing growth in the spring semester. So the discussion that has taken place many times in recent years continues about how to help more students who need us find their way to our colleges. We want to improve access. At the same time, we want to be improving those student outcomes. So the pathways will do both things. And uh, the broader themes for pathways are about alignment, integration, and resources. And uh, I've shared with other groups, sometimes you wonder what a chancellor does. How many of you kind of deep down say, what does a chancellor do <laughs> besides come to convocation, talk for a few minutes, then all the suits sort of trapes off and go someplace else. And uh, we have other conversations throughout the course of the year. But I think this, these three points uh, go a long way to explain what my hope is that I can do to help you. Help align things among our four colleges when it makes sense, understanding that there are some things that make sense to be done based on the unique needs of our college. But when it makes sense for our students to redesign their experience in a way that's consistent, that's an area where our district can provide leadership. In integrating different services for students, that's another area where there are opportunities more of our students are going to more than one college, so having an integration of their expectations is important. And finally, getting the resources. We've talked about the state budget. A lot of my time in the next few months will be in the Capitol, meeting with uh, the governor's staff and, and legislators, helping them see that we need more operating dollars, among other things, and on pathways, helping that trailer bill language be crafted in a way 
that it's not a new initiative for us, but helps advance the work that's already taking place. So alignment, integration, and resources are all very important parts of the work that I am doing to support the work you're doing. When you think about integration and alignment, first of all, truth, time for a confession. How many of you had a pager at one time? How many of you were old enough to have a pager? Why did you have a pager? Why, why did you have? The, some, you couldn't be called if you were not near a phone. So Celia, my daughter, there was a time when a phone had a cord. And there was also a time when people talked on their phone, but that's, that's a topic for another day with today's generation. They, they don't talk to each other, if you've noticed. So an example, one use of my pager when your mother was expecting to give birth to you, if I would go for a run, I would take my pager with me so if she went into labor, I could go to a phone and then get where I needed to be. You were very cooperative, so I didn't have to, to do that. <laughs> then a little later, <laughs> who had an early cell phone? Okay, You were pretty cool, weren't you? You had, had that brick phone. The range wasn't great. And what did it cost per minute, especially if you were roaming? It was like $900 a minute if you were out of your service area. But when you think about it, those first phones, that's late 70s, early 80s, this, this early technology that looks like it's 100 years old. Oh, yeah, some of us are going, I remember the Palm Pilot. Who, who loved the Palm Pilot? It had a cool name. What did it do? It kept all your schedules, all your contacts, all in one place. It wasn't on paper. You could sync it with a computer. God help you if you wanted to sync it with two computers. Technology, or did you try? Yeah. It didn't work that well. But it was a, a breakthrough technology, and for a time, oh, another one. How many of you were there for the first iPod? Okay, we got a lot of people. How many still use your iPod? Okay, some do. Now you could take hundreds of songs with you wherever you went, right? So you look at all these advances in technology, when you think about it, the problems that those technologies were created to solve still exist. We still care about being able to make phone calls on the move. We want to be in communication when we're not bound to our office. We want to be able to coordinate and integrate our lives. The Palm Pilot had your schedule, your calendar. It was a bringing together. And then the iPod, you could take music with you wherever you went. And who remembers what happens almost, happened almost 10 years ago to the day? A guy named Steve Jobs on January 9th, 2007, rolled out what at the time was a, a, an amazingly new product. So that's only 10 years ago that he did the I, I, iPhone rollout. How many of you have watched the presentation? I'd encourage you, if you've never watched the full presentation, it's interesting to think of how far we've come into 10 years. It's also a brilliant presentation where Jobs skillfully did the same work that many of you are doing to talk about the present state and uh, realize that there's a better state through doing something different. And in your strategic planning, in a lot of ways, you're doing what Apple did, looking at the current state, realizing that people have worked hard to get it where it is, but that there are ways to align and integrate your work so you're in a better place. So let's do the poll. Hold up, if you have an iPhone with you, how many of you are still loyal to the iPhone? Oh, Apple would be happy. How many of you have another brand? Okay, Android, Android phones? Anybody have a Windows phone? I didn't think so. <laughs> but the point is, Apple's not the only way to solve that problem, that there are other ways to approach it, and the same is true of our four colleges. When we look to align, it doesn't have to be one solution and one operating system. There are different solutions that are appropriate to our four different colleges. There are also times when it makes sense for our students to have a consistent approach across our four colleges. And, uh, and Jobs had a quote I really like about how hard the work is from going to complex to simple. When you think about many of our systems, they're complicated not because we want it to be complicated, but over time we kept adding new good things, right? So before long you started with a process that was fairly simple, and now it's complicated. And, and to say we're going to return to simplicity can sound easy, but I think Jobs nails it. Simple can be harder than complex. You agree? Sometimes making things simple is much harder than keeping doing it the really hard way that we're already doing it. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. 
and that's what you've been doing here at Folsom Lake and our other colleges are doing in various planning meetings, doing the hard work to clear our minds so we can acknowledge some things that are complex that need to be more simple. And he says it's worth it in the end because once you get there, you can move mountains. And that's what we're doing. We're moving mountains for our students. So the hard work of looking at what's complex and making it simple is going to have a big impact. And so much work has been underway. We had district-wide between 100 and 150 faculty and staff attending a Pathways Conference on December 8th and 9th here in Sacramento. And I had a chance to speak on a panel to our faculty and staff who were there and also between five and 600 uh, people from around the state interested in how they can redesign the student experience. And I want to share with them the, the big message, share with you the same message that I shared with them. The work of building pathways at Folsom Lake and at our colleges is fundamentally your work. It's not something that I or anyone can come and tell you what it should be. You are the subject matter ex experts in faculty. You're the subject, ac matter, subject matter experts in student services. You know what the student needs are. You know what the barriers are. So I want to support you in your work, but make it, make it really clear that only you can do this work. And I'm very excited and encouraged by what I'm hearing about the discussions you've had today and in recent weeks and months about acknowledging that you're ready to do that work. Are you ready? Yes. I believe it. <laughs> so we started back in August and gave away a couple hundred copies of Redesigning America's Community Colleges. How many of you have read the book? A lot of people have. I get emails from it about it from time to time. And uh, Troy Myers, one of our Sac City faculty members, is leading an online discussion. So if you'd like to get engaged in that and haven't had a chance to, let me know. And part of the feedback I got was, well, one book is not going to answer all our questions. And I couldn't agree more. The idea of one book being an answer for every question is not really going to move you very far. But when we think about students, the ideas in a book like Re Redesigning America's Community Colleges give us a framework for thinking about how we can look at redesigning the way we do things for students to help make it better for them. We're doing it for the students, both present and future. A lot of our students are the first time uh, student from their family to attend college. And even for those of us who were in that situation, it's hard to remember sometimes what it's like and the barriers for a first time student coming to college. They've overcome a lot of barriers even to reach us. And many are not reaching us from barriers that we want to knock down. Technology is not the only way to eliminate those barriers, but I want to share with you some technology initiatives that are exciting and helping redesign our processes with the caveat that technology doesn't, technology alone, buying the product doesn't solve the problem. How many of you have a Fitbit? Raise it high if you have it. <laughs> Raise your other hand so you get some points for using it. <laughs> Anybody have something like a Fitbit? Another one of those devices? So you bought it one day, right? or it was given to you, were you healthier as soon as you had it? <laughs> oh, if only it worked that way, that you just bought a tool and all of a sudden things were different. But the reason that you bought it, and hopefully nobody gave it to you trying to convey that message, <laughs> you bought that device because you knew there was something you wanted to do that was different. You wanted to improve your life. You wanted to change some of your habits. So the tools help you do that. But if we don't also do that difficult work of actually talking about what we need to do differently, it's just another tool that's not making any difference. <laughs> so our district is going through the process of a technology plan. We celebrated, Sue, you got a standing ovation, but you have to get the technology plan done yes. before July. So Sue is doing a great job <laughs> leading that effort. And I want to share several areas in technology where we're making great progress together. Each of our four colleges has a website. And I'm really pleased with our four colleges working collaboratively on an effort to look not just at the website, but the whole process from first contact to application to admission to enrollment and beyond. So let's be honest with each other today. How many of you have either gone through that process or walked someone through the process from start to finish? How many of you have done that lately? How many of you think that it's exactly perfect the way it is? It's hard to get through that process, and that's not a criticism. Back to, it's the way it is for good reasons. We've added different things along the way. 
And we also have some state requirements, the California Communi Community College Apply process, CC Apply, CCC Apply, adds some, uh, some questions we add in the process. So we need to have that discussion both at the local and the state level. How do we make that process easier to navigate? And we need to ask ourselves, what are the expectations that students have when they come to the process? A lot of examples, but one that comes to mind is Amazon.com. How many Amazon Prime members do we have here? We're not patient, are we? Okay, we're paying something so we can get it in two days instead of three. And if you wanted to order America's, uh, Redesigning America's Community Colleges, and I, I hope no one's shopping right now, but if you are, all you have to do is enter Redesigning America's Community College. The book pops up. You don't even have to get the title right. If you have Redesigning Colleges, the book pops up. It's not hard to order. You click, and it can come the next day. And all of you are familiar with that uh, frequently bought together. <laughs> if you liked one thing, here's another thing that you might like. It's very seamless. So obviously, we don't have the millions and maybe even billions of dollars to invest in technology that Amazon.com does. But we know that our students have expectations for this sort of system. So we need to be aware of those expectations and work together to have a more seamless process on things like the application process for our students. Really great news that we haven't shared too much because it's just uh, uh, premiering this semester. We have a student payment plan now, so our students who do not qualify for financial aid don't have to pay all their fees at once. Now they can pay in installments. So I know a lot of people are involved in making this happen. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Internet is so essential. How many of you would have a problem if you came to work and the internet connection didn't work? How many of you would secretly be relieved for a day? So we, both of those emotions can, can exist. But uh, we're at the point now with internet access that it is a baseline expectation. And uh, we have uh, some great work that's happened working with Comcast. So we now have both a direct uh, pipeline and a backup pipeline for internet. So if one system goes down, our colleges will still be online. So it's not glamorous, but it's a big deal and a significant investment in infrastructure. Another transition that's underway that I want to thank all of you who have been involved. I know this is not an easy transition. We've gone from D2L or are going from D2L to Canvas. Let's do a quick poll. How many of you are teaching a class in Canvas this semester? So many of you have already made that transition. Back to that idea of uh, the seamless experience for students, understanding that any system has pros and cons. Having one system across all, all four colleges that's supported by the statewide chancellor's office is a good solution for our students. So I appreciate the effort that you've put in in doing that and also the work between our uh, collective bargaining partners and our, our uh, leaders in this project to provide compensation for faculty members who are making that change. I think that's worth applause, isn't it? To be compensated for additional work. We talked in August about the Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative, that's hard to say, IEPI, and a chance to access $750,000 in funds through the Chancellor's Office for enrollment management. We've been talking for a while about the need to increase access and enrollment, and also to uh, develop systems and, and uh, identify some tools to help us in this work. Hardly ever does this happen, but from the time we started, we found out we were going to qualify for a million dollars through IEPI, and we're, we're narrowing the focus. I know a, a team visited here at Folsom Lake. How many of you met with the peer resource team that came? Many of you here did. So we've had a good conversation with peers from around the state. Now each college in the district office is narrowing down the priorities, what to do with these funds. There's consensus that having a course scheduling system across our four colleges would be helpful. We have different systems and different capabilities now. So on that area, there is consensus. An area that is going to require additional uh, discussion is finding tools that help align that student experience. So we'll have more discussions about how to do that. But it's, it's awesome to have a million dollars to help defray some of those costs. We don't know what the final cost will be, but we'll keep finding the resources to make that transition. So the big picture, whether it's technology or systems, is taking what can be a maze at times and making that pathway straight for our students. Our students are fairly clear in telling us what they want and expect, 
And they're also pretty honest in telling us some of the difficulties that they encounter in doing that. So we have a shared interest, and I know a commitment to doing that work together. The College Promise. Rancho Cordova was the first city in the Capital Region to step up and support a College Promise program. So let's give the mayor another round of applause. We've talked about pathways and promises, and at times, in thinking about what a pathway is, we're having robust discussions about that, and promise programs. How many different promise programs are there across the United States? Now, there are probably hundreds of different promise programs, so part of our discussion will be looking at what the promise means for our region. We've, uh, we've led the way with Rancho Cordova, the partnership, and we've also been involved in the national discussion. I know several, how many of you here went to the National Promise meeting? I know several people from Folsom Lake did and from other, other colleges. So we're involved in that national conversation. There are a lot of state promises too. You may have heard of the, have heard of the Tennessee Promise, the Oregon Promise, or our new Chancellor Eloy Oakley, uh, now past president of Long Beach City College. How many of you have heard of the Long Beach College Promise? It's received a lot of play nationally. So part of our discussion is having a convening, which we will in the next few weeks, with uh, stakeholders from all four colleges, from faculty, from staff, and also from the community and city council members and mayors coming together to talk about how to engage our entire region in this effort, in the Promise effort. So look forward to having input and helping define and expand our College Promise opportunities. Does California have a Promise program now? It's a bit of a trick question because we do have a BOG fee waiver. Now, what is the BOG? It's the Board of Governors. The marketing is not perfect. I mean, when you hear BOG, you know, we've got a BOG for you. Um, no thanks. But we know that more than half of our students qualify for the Board of Governors fee waivers now. So part of what we need to be doing in the alignment is marketing better what we already have. We don't always have to do something new. But the, the vision would be for students in middle school and their parents have a clear idea that if they do certain things, they'll be eligible for their fees to be paid. So having that ingrained in the culture of the boys and girls and their parents throughout the capital region, that there is an affordable path to college. So sometimes part of the discussion will just be, how can we reframe what we call the BOG waiver? And one of our trustees, Pamela Haynes, serves on the Board of Governors, and we've had that conversation. We don't have to call it the BOG fee waiver. We could call it the Folsom Lake Promise Scholarship or the Los Rios Capital Region Promise. That will be part of the discussion we have. How do we reframe some of our existing tools in a way that makes them more accessible? So right now, we have two Promise programs where residents will be benefiting as soon as this fall. Rancho Cordova to the east, 100,000, and that amount is only going to grow from the city of Rancho Cordova. That's an initial commitment, but Mayor Terry and the council members completely get that the need is going to grow and supporting these programs. They are, are great leaders and great partners as we talk to other cities in the region about what we can do. The second city, you'll always be first, Mayor, was the city of West Sacramento, Mayor Christopher Cabaldon, in November, was successful and the city council in passing an initiative that brings 400,000 every year to a promise effort. $400,000. And both of these efforts are centered on <coughs> residents of their city. So what we ultimately want to do is expand. We're having conversations with Mayor Steinberg with the city of Sacramento. Mayor Steinberg's very supportive of this concept. And ultimately, we want to reach out to all the cities, all the counties, all the businesses, so that in a five-year period, we'll have a flood, sort of apropos this week. Some, someone asked about the blue color. We're going to have a flood of promise programs throughout our region. So there are a lot of ideas for promise. There are many good ones. Our initial focus needs to be a promise we can deliver. So are you ready for the classroom portion of today's convocation? Are you ready to participate? Five Fs as a baseline for our promise program. So if you'll read these with me, the first one, fee free for first time, full time, recent high school graduates. Let's do it one more time, okay? <laughs> Be free for first time, full time, recent high school graduates. Make sense? 
as a starting point. Obviously, we want to do more. We, we want to impact more than recent high school graduates. We want to do more than fees. We know that books, transportation, living expenses are also huge problems for our students. But in the next five years, if we could deliver on this promise, that would be transformative for our region. So we will continue the conversation in the coming weeks with broad constituent input on where we are, where we need to be, how we can leverage. I, I, I just want to take Mayor Terry with me everywhere I go, that he's so enthusiastic in talking to other cities. So we're going to develop a coherent approach for our whole region. So it's a great potential, and we have a good start. And give yourselves a round of applause. Folsom Lake is first with the Rancho Cordova pro promise. So the final theme today is about regional collaboration. I love this African proverb that sums it up. If you want to go fast, what do you do? Go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Now let's back up for a second. That's true for us as a district, too. There are times where one college may be going faster and you can get something done, but with the reality that more of our students are going to more than one of our colleges, Sometimes we want to know that we'll go farther together among our four colleges. And that concept definitely extends to our broader region. Many of the problems that we know we need to solve, we know we can't solve alone as a community college district. We need partnerships with mayors and city councils. We need partnerships with business. We need different points of view. If we're going to improve how well prepared our students are, we can't just point fingers. We have to partner with K-12 districts and faculty. So that broad theme is if we want to go fast, we can do it by ourselves. If we want to go far and really do the deep work, we need to do it together. So uh, on regional collaboration, I want to share very briefly two organizations that are new, where our district and our colleges are very actively involved in the collaboration. One is Align Capital Region. And Align Capital Region started with the steering committee, and now the steering committee has about 32 members. And the majority of the members on the steering committee are not from education. There are leaders from education, the president of Sacramento State, the chancellor of UC Davis, and, uh, and several county superintendents and, and also district superintendents. But the majority of members on Align Capital Region are business leaders who have a very important perspective on how we can work, how we can work together and community leaders. Getting this group together is itself powerful. And one example of what we've been able to do at a steering committee meeting in November, uh, Interim Chancellor Hexter from UC Davis, President Nelson and I were at a meeting, and we were all very concerned about how we could express support for our dream students. So we talked about the idea of collaborating on an editorial to the Sacramento Bee, and we were able, and, and it's not easy to coordinate when you have one author, when you have three, and the staffs, and our staff is usually a staff of one when we do something like this collaboratively, our colleagues at the universities have extensive staff involvement, but we were able to work together and get a consistent message on behalf of our students. And this past Wednesday, Trustee Knight and our Board of Trustees courageously approved a, re uh, a resolution in support of our dream students. So let's show our appreciation to the Board of Trustees. So regionally, having the right people together to look at the whole situation for our community is important. I want to share with you four long-term, big, ambitious goals for Align Capital Region. First is college readiness, and we've talked about the importance of having students who come to us ready to succeed in college-level work. Can we do that just within the boundaries of our college district? We can't. We need partnership with our K-12 school districts. We need business leaders to say, we need to improve college readiness, and it's not an exercise in finger pointing. We know that our K-12 systems have immense challenges in meeting this uh, goal of college readiness. Educational attainment, once our students arrive, we want to make sure that they earn the certificates and degrees they need to be effective in the workplace. And from our business partners, they don't want students who have graduated alone. They want students who have graduated and are ready to do the job. So there's a good conversation about what career readiness looks like. And the fourth long-term regional outcome is community vitality. Think about all the other conditions that are necessary, good health, tackling homelessness, and also arts and culture in our region. So 
the view for our line capital region is that we're much stronger together and we can go farther together. So I'm really excited about the potential of this regional effort. We're a big region and other regions that have, have used this sort of approach have been successful. But in many ways, we're the largest region in the country to embark on an effort like this. So we're going to be the largest, most successful region in the United States with a metro area of over 2 million that's going to come together and be really committed to shared goals. The second organization I wanted to, to, talk, to uh, talk with you about briefly is Greater Sacramento, the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council. Greater Sacramento for short. How many of you have heard of Greater Sacramento? Greater Sacramento is a fairly new organization. Its mission is to retain businesses who are here, create a healthy economic climate, and recruit new businesses. So you can see why our community college district is really crucial in the work of Greater Sacramento. We're members in the organization, and whenever there are meetings to discuss bringing new businesses to the region, it's very important that we are there because providing uh, students who are ready and able to do the work is very interested in, uh, uh, of great interest to business who, businesses who are thinking about coming here. And just in the last week, we've had two meetings where uh, a large group of business, businesses came in one, instance, in one instance from the Bay Area and another from the Central Valley where they were very impressed with what this organization is doing. We'll send you a link after convocation, but has anyone seen the video? Greater Sacramento has a nice video about our region we'll send you the link. It's at selectsacramento.com, but it really captures some of the excitement in our region. This is my fifth year of uh, being involved in convocation, and I look at all the great things that have happened here and throughout the Sacra Sacramento region just in five years. So the arc of our region is definitely on the way up. Would you agree there's never been a better time to live here and be here? Isn't that an awesome thing to be able to say? Greater Sacramento, in uh, talking to businesses, talks about the talent advantage that we have as a region, and we're very important, obviously, in developing the educated workforce and the talent that keeps businesses here and brings businesses from other places. The affordability of our region, compared to almost any place in, in California, we have a great value, and also access to education here, access to a great community, and proximity uh, from anywhere from the Bay Area where you can stick your toe in the surf in the morning and then be skiing in 12 feet of snow in the Sierras by the afternoon. So Greater Sacramento is a great partner and, and we're a great partner to them in, in working to have the work workforce we need for the future. So as always, I encourage you, if you have feedback, if there's something that you've heard today that you think that we're on the right track, and also if there's something you wanna give me feedback that you think I need to know that maybe I don't know, I encourage you to send me an email. It's very helpful to get that sort of feedback. And I appreciate, appreciate that many of you do take that opportunity and are good to give me that sort of feedback. So in conclusion, Monday is the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. So I thought the best way to wrap up would be with one of the many great quotes from Dr. King that I think summarizes what we've talked about today, this idea. It takes a community effort. It involves the whole person. It's not education it, alone. It's also meeting basic human needs and also working together. So we'll wrap up with a, a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, I have the audacity to believe that people everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. That's what we do. That's what you do. Let's get out there and do it for another semester. Thanks for letting me spend some time with you today.